Friends, we'd like you to stay tuned to some wonderful singing by our young people, as well as some lovely testimonies. Your heart is going to be encouraged. These are many of the young people that gave the heart to Christ recently, and it's been a real thrill to all of us older ones as we looked on and we saw them coming to the Savior. It's been a tremendous occasion and uh, a spiritual awakening amongst many of our young people. We thank God for them, and uh, we try to capture them on tape so that you could uh, be blessed in your own heart. Just, rem just be mindful of the fact that they've just recently trusted the Lord. God bless you now as you watch and as you listen. Well, it's a great, great morning, your first day in heaven when you stroll down the golden avenue. There are mansions left and right, and you thrill at every sight, and the saints are always smiling, saying, how do you do? Oh, it's a great, great morning, your first day in heaven when you realize your worrying days are through. You'll be glad you were not idle, took time to read your Bible, it's a great morning for you. I was an angel at the great pearly gate. St. Peter said, why, hello there, where have you been? We've got your mansion ready, so come right in. And then he rang for an angel to act as a guide. He spread his wings a time or two to learn how to fly. Oh, it's a great, great morning, your first day in heaven when you stroll down the golden avenue. There are mansions left and right, and you thrill at every sight, and the saints are always smiling, saying, how do you do? Oh, it's a great, great morning, your first day in heaven, when you realize your worrying days are through. You'll be glad you were not idle, took time to read your Bible, it's a great morning, a great morning. the way that Jesus can. He proved his love for me when he died on Calvary. He gave his life for fallen man. His love, his love is a boundless love and it reaches down and touches me. Touches me. His love, his love is a endless love that will last through all eternity. Jesus wants to love you, there is none above you, you are precious in his sight. He will never fail you, when the doubts assail you, he'll be with you day and night. His love is a boundless love, and it reaches down and touches me. His love is an endless love. That will last through all eternity. His love, His love is a boundless love, and it reaches down and touches me. His love, His love is an endless love that will last through all eternity. His love. Love. Brothers and sisters, I want to share with you uh, two verses in James 2, 17 and 18. It's talking about faith without good deeds is dead, and good deeds without faith we know is dead. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is deed, it is dead and useless. Now some Someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, this is the Lord saying this, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. So many of us, are brothers and sisters, 
We got the faith. But do we, do we be like the Good Samaritan? Do we show Jesus to someone each and every day? Not maybe once a year. Once in, a, once in our lifetime. We have the remedy. The remedy is Jesus Christ. But are we using it, brothers and sisters? And I'm talking to myself too. I met it wrong for many years. You become a Christian and then that's it. But it ain't that. It ain't that, brothers and sisters. You become a Christian and you're, and, you're, and you're being called to live a holy life. You're being called to show Jesus, not every week, each and every day. Amen. And brothers and sisters, I want to let you know, if you have it wrong, if you had it wrong for many years, it's time to look at the cross, come at the foot of Jesus and get it right. It's time to get it right. You see what's happening here? You see what's happening on the island? One person, it took one person. He came, he had Jesus in his life, and he showed Jesus. He used Jesus through him, and Jesus used him because he was a pure man. And that was only one person, and all this happened. So many of us could do the same. But are we doing the same, brothers and sisters? We have the remedy. And the remedy is Jesus Christ. The flowers couldn't lift their heads on hills of grass so green. The sun would never shine to cause the river silver sheen. The bird would have no song to sing from high up in the tree if there had been no Calvary. of a friend The wasted blood would flood the streets of sin society If there had been no Calvary Lost, but now 
I'm found was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fear. Good. 
goodness lost but for his blood when i see who he is i realize what i am and i wonder why a holy god would ever reach down so far and place me in his hand my ears have heard the story can't turn away from His grace. I'm incredibly, miraculously saved. When I see who He is, I realize what I am. And I wonder why a holy God would ever reach down so far. And I can't turn away from His grace. I'm incredibly, miraculously saved. I'm incredibly, miraculously saved.
Uh, I'm going to give a part of my testimony tonight. you got to bear with me. Um, uh, always lived, never, never really got into, well, I always got in trouble, but <laughs> I never got in, you know, seriously, nothing really too bad, but uh, just living the wrong life. And we was down to Egg Island, me, Keevan, Clarence, and Trent, uh, sleeping in Mr. Lincoln's house, uh, <laughs> rain. But uh, before I went, Mommy told me, you can't go if, if you don't come up for this youth, youth, these youth services that they're having in the ball field. So, you know, I, I say, I'll get out of that. I, she, she won't get me in that. I'll just stay down there, say the bro boats broke down, I don't come home. So, uh, something happens. Uh, I go, go down to Garland, and we want to use Papa's Little Willow, you know, my favorite boat. <laughs> um, so, they had to take it off an houseboat, and um, something happened. She, she, so she's smart, you know. So she told Papa I couldn't take the I couldn't take the whale until I promised him that I'd come up for the youth service. And you know, I can't break promises, but I promised to Papa. That's my papa. And so uh I go, you know, get the whaler. Promise him I'm coming up. So, well, uh, now I'm gotta go. So mommy, I go down there, we was down there for three days, uh showering in cold water. So uh, mommy calls me, you better come on, you better come on, you stay down there, you're punished, I'll send your pa down there for you. <laughs> all right, all right. Next day, this is night, that was the night before, next day, day four, that was a Wednesday night, says, she calls me, you better go, I'll send your pa down there for you. Say, all right, all right. So right before, right before, uh, around, that was in the morning, around after lunch sometime, I call her, you know, it's no, not too much a good service down there. So I'm up on top of Mr. Lincoln's roof. Mommy, do I have to go? I don't want to go. So she makes me go. I called her like 40 times. You know, she, just, she makes me go. So we all got it planned. We ain't go. We only could go out for the first night. Coming back down, that'll be it. You gotta stay. So, go out for the first night. All plan to leave. Leave 12 o'clock at night to go back. Back down there, go and sleep down there. All of a sudden, thunderstorm. Can't go back. Have to leave the whaler down there. Six gas tanks. Let her ride. Leave them down there. Stay for the next night. We go in the next, we, all the sky clears all up. We go in the next night. All of a sudden, when we get from the um, ball field, downpour, can't go. Uh, so, um, the next night, uh, I guess it's by God's grace that we happen to stay. Um, you know, I was petrified because Nate said he was going to call. Everybody was going to say that they was a Christian and say something, say it was, it was uh, be a Christian, and I was just petrified. They just said they was gonna prove their faith. So I was sitting there petrified, and all of a sudden, when he's getting to the end of his message, telling a story about his friend, all of a sudden the lights cut out, uh, heavy wind comes, rain all around us, um, and it don't come back on, and all of a sudden, starts singing a song and everybody starts going up, going up, going up, and it hit me that I need to be saved. And I need to change my life, and give it to Jesus. And I gave my life to Jesus and now I'm a new man. And it's a verse in Second Corinthians six, no actually five, verse seventeen. Therefore I've no, it starts 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Through we once regarded Christ, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we so we do so not no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 
The new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. And um, I just put all my sins behind me. Because Jesus says he put them as far as east is from the west. So, thank you. To a place unexpected Would you believe After all we projected A child in a manger Lowly and small The weakest of all Unlikeliest hero Wrapped in his mother's shawl Just a child Is this who we waited for? This who we waited From their thrones, how many lords have abandoned their homes? How many graves have become the least for me? How many gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that has torn all apart? How many fathers gave up their sons for me? For a newborn Savior, all that we have, whether costly or meek, because we believe. Gold for his honor and frankincense for his pleasure and mirth for the cross he'll suffer. Do you believe? This is who we waited is this for. Who we Along the lines of what some of our other brothers were talking about, um, yes, it is very vital and very essential to show love to your Christian brothers and sisters, but I also, hand in hand with that, uh, goes the concept of, of forgiveness. I'd like if you, if you could turn uh, one chapter over from 
the chapter that um, Kirby just read to Matthew 18. If you want to start at verse um, 21. This is a well-known parable. You probably heard many, many messages on it. Um, it starts in verse 21 with Peter coming to Jesus first and asking him, it says, Then Peter came to him, Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. I once heard someone say that uh, it was a custom of the day that uh, three times was the limit. Three times the Jews had a custom that, you know, it was customary to say three times. So Peter was thinking to himself, okay, well, well I'll, I'll, I'll be gracious here. I'll extend that. I'll say seven. Who knows? I don't know whether he was thinking. I know seven is, is like the number of perfection in the Bible, but he, I, he thought he was being gracious. He was extending that, and surely Jesus would say, yeah, that's, that's good, Peter. But if you look in the next verse, it says, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven, 490, if you do the math. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to go out and if I've got to personally keep track of every single time that I'm required to forgive somebody, I'd rather not do it. I think Jesus, the point Jesus is making is unlimited forgiveness. But how often do we, as, as this, what's about to be read in this parable, how often do we let bitterness and anger get in our way? L listen to the parable. That's verse uh, 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Millions, some, comment, some commentators say. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. If the story ended there, it'd be, wow, good, what a happy ending. Unfortunately, it takes a plot twist, says, but that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. A denarii was a day's wage, so that'd be like a hundred days' wages, a little over three months' wages. And he laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Where have we seen this before? It happened just a couple minutes ago, right? But he would not, and went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. And this, look at this last verse. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Am I standing before you tonight saying that that's an easy thing to do? No. I know what it is. I've been there. I, I, I have walked the path of harboring bitterness in my heart. It's not an easy path for any of us. But this passage makes it clear. The king, the king is God. We, when we look at what we owe God or what he has done for us, look at the huge debt and then we can go out, our brothers or our sisters that might have done this offense, that little offense. Maybe it not, might not be a little offense. It might be something big. I don't know what you're carrying. I don't know what. And I know from experience it is not an easy thing. But I think these verses in this parable makes it clear that if we are to be to, to bear the name of Christ and to call ourselves Christians, not only uh, 
must we show love, but might we must show our love through forgiveness. True forgiveness. Notice the verse, notice verse 35, the last verse says, um, from his heart, if, if each of you from his heart, how often do we say we extend forgiveness to someone, but it's not genuine. Deep inside, we're still harboring the thing that's troubling us. We need to realize God, even as his son, Jesus, was being nailed to a cross. Think of that. Think of, you, you are being, you, 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 whips scourging you, crown of thorns pressing on you. Your flesh is being mauled, mutilated. You are being nailed to a cross. And, and Jesus could say, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And how often do we carry all our hurts and our offenses? Life is too short, my brothers and sisters. It's time to not only show Christians with love, that we are Christians with love, but to show that we are Christian brothers and sisters with forgiveness. I ask you to consider this tonight. Consider the words of Jesus. Thanks. Tonight, I'd like to share with you a message. I've preached on it from different angles many, many times, but we never can over-preach, if I may use the term, on the subject of forgiveness. The world is dying tonight. 
uh, because of a lack of knowing the God of heaven and Jesus who died for them, who is always there with outstretched hands to receive them and to forgive them for all of their sins. A word that's missing in the vocabulary of preaching today of many preachers today is the word repentance. Now, what does repentance mean? It simply means a right about faith. That's why Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel of the kingdom and repentance. He used the word uh, himself. And then he said, Take courage, my son. Your sins are forgiven you. And quoted, of course, in Matthew, from Matthew 9, 2. Remember the poor uh, paralactic who his friends brought uh, into the room by way of letting him down in the roof. What an unusual circumstance, unique. But they must have loved their dear friends, and the four of them gently let him down through the roof. And Jesus, the first thing he, he said, thy son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, they were all shocked at this. Some of them said, who can forgive sins but God? Not realizing who Jesus really uh, was or even is at the time. And so they, he said, is it more difficult to say, Son, thy sin be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and walk? And so he said, rise up and walk to the man, and he stood up, healed. His ankle bones received strength, and he was able to walk as a, a, a man that was perfectly healed. My friend, listen, Jesus had the power, though, to forgive that man. I don't know if he was in that condition because of his sin, the Lord no doubt knew more about him uh, than we can imagine. Listen, my friend, forgiveness and repentance are very, very important today. That's a positive forgiveness. Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. There was no conditions, just a, a flat or out, outstanding statement by Jesus, and he was forgiven, positively so. And then we come to the proclamation of forgiveness when Jesus gave us the authority to go and preach it, the verse that I mentioned a little while ago, we are to preach the gospel and repentance, forgiveness and repentance. So there's a proclamation of, of the gospel, the proclamation of forgiveness. Oh, I tell you, many, many people perish because they will not surrender. I think way back in World War II, and of course I was a young man then, I followed it very closely because my brother was in the army and he was crossing the Rhine. And they came, General Hodges, they came to a town called Aiken or Aikon. Anyhow, uh, the, before really uh, shooting the heavy artillery, it was obvious that the Germans were retreating and they were failing. And they summoned them to surrender. This is a true incident in life. And they said, no, we will not surrender. The commander, whoever was in charge of the army, he refused to surrender. It was a sad occasion because they were not able uh, to fight the forces that were approaching. The Allies were approaching with tremendous force, a huge army, and um, they had to fire on that, that town. In the town of Aiken, or Aken, listen, 165,000 people died needlessly because they would not or the commanders would not surrender. How many people die in life now? We're getting now to the nitty-gritty uh, responsibility of every individual that I'm speaking to. If you're not a Christian, listen, how, are you holding out on God? Are you saying some other time? Are you waiting and are you just keep, are you keep putting it off? Your pastors preach sermon after sermon. You or nodded your head that it was a good sermon. You went home that night, but it didn't move you to repentance and to ask for God's forgiveness and to accept him into your heart as your Savior and Lord. And you bypassed, you let it go by. And here you are, still without Christ, insecure. And you know as well as I, that you're destined for one place or the other. What will it be? My friend, wake up. May the Spirit of God just arouse you tonight to see this. Then who's the person of forgiveness? John 3, 16, every child can quote that verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It's a gift of God. 
You heard me say again and again, you can't earn it, you can't work for it, that is, and you can't buy it. And I've, I've said this, and it bears repeating. Number one, God is too rich. He doesn't need to sell. And you and I are too poor. We can't afford to buy it. The tag would be way beyond uh, our means. It's uh, literally impossible. How can you pay for something that was paid for by the death of God's beloved son? The debt has been paid. The debt of our sin, it says he became sin for us, that we should be relieved of the judgment of sin. God placed his sin upon his son, allowed, rather, his, our sin to be placed upon him. He became our precious substitute, and he died in our place. Thus, when we repent and receive him as our Savior, we'll know the joy of sins forgiven. Boy, what a wonderful thing it is to know. Go to bed tonight. All the sins you ever committed, list them, adultery, drunkenness, dope, whatever it is you've been on, wife beating, uh, abuse of children, maybe you're in prison, and uh, you know that you're there because of what you did. But if you're listening or, listening or looking at this telecast, listen, I want you to know that God loves you. He hates sin. He hates my sin, but he loves you. And he wants to forgive you of all your sin. And you can be a new man, a new woman in Jesus Christ, regardless of what you have done in life. Remember that. The call is to the whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so we have the forgiveness of forgiveness. We have the proclamation of forgiveness. We have the person of forgiveness who is none other than Jesus himself. And then, of course, we have the passing of judgment. Listen to this verse, John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has life and does not come under judgment, but has been passed from death to life. Boy, that's wonderful. Here's the passing of judgment. Here is no matter what happens in life. When death comes because you are free and you have eternal life in your heart and uh, you can go forth as a, as a free person, knowing the joy of the Lord, and there's no judgment awaiting you. Don't let nobody kid you. There is a judgment coming. It's an awful judgment. M.F. Rich, that wealthy, wealthy man, said when he was dying, Oh, that I knew that I had trusted God, that I had believed the Bible. He said, I'd rather be lying on coals for a thousand years, hot coals for a thousand years. Many other things, he said, rather than die in my sin, to be lost in eternity and in hell forever and forever and forever. This man was so, uh, so upset about the fact that he was dying without God. Oh, if somebody could have been there and just told him that there is a person who could forgive him all of his sin. Jesus Christ himself. And so the passing of judgment, there's no judgment to you, no condemnation to you that are in Christ Jesus. And then, of course, you got the position of sinners, too. It, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, said Jesus, but those who are ill. But go learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That was the purpose of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, calling sinners to himself. I'm so glad that verse is in the Bible because that's the position that I was in. And even tonight, I'm only a sinner saved by grace, by the grace of God. And you too can know the joy of this forgiveness. Repent and receive Christ into your heart. Remember, he died for you. God gave up his son. I quote the verse again, For God so loved the world that he gave his only beloved Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. Where could you ever get an insurance anywhere in the world company to offer you something like that? Literally impossible. You see, what God gives you is not only for this life, but it's for life beyond the grave, the assurance, the security. Your destiny will be heaven. You know what heaven is like? Heaven is best described by what's not there rather than what is there. 
All I know is going to Revelation, the book of Revelation, there's no death, no, no clinic, no hospital, no prisons. You won't find the curse of sin there. There's no sin. You won't find any of those things that really are vulgar and upsetting, those things that are contrary to the will of God and, and to the word of God. You won't find arrogancy there. You won't find rebellion there. You won't find anything that's distorted, anything that's crooked, anything that's lewd, anything that's wicked. You will not find it in heaven. It'll be peace forever. A place with a new body that'll never grow weary, a body that'll never be sick, a body that will never need to, to feed or have food. And uh, there's so much in it, it being an advantage, but the greatest thing of all, we will be with Jesus Christ our Lord forever and forever and forever. My friend, can you get anything to be better than that? I hope to God, pray to God tonight, that you're not going to hold off. You're not going to uh, pass this opportunity by. You've heard many gospel sermons. This is perhaps in your eyes or your ears tonight, just another sermon. My friend, my prayer is to, my prayer to God is that you'll bow the knee to Christ, that you'll let him in. Let him come into your heart. Don't, don't delay. Every moment in your life is very, very precious. Oh, I could tell you story after story of men who, who did not respond and were soon cut off in life. And they never had an opportunity to bow the knee to Christ. What a sad thing. And so you have the positiveness of forgiveness, the proclamation of forgiveness. You have the person of forgiveness, Jesus himself. You have the passing of judgment, forgiven, because you pass from death unto life. The position as a sinner, and now you're a child of God, uh, as we have in Matthew 9, 12, and 13. And then, of course, listen to this. Luke 7, 41. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 uh, denarii, and the other, when they were, uh, it says, and they were unable to pay, he frankly or graciously forgave them both. My friend, listen. One owed 500, let's say pence, and the other 50. Pence, one penny was a day's labor. Just imagine. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. That's what God does. I, I've repeated again, you can't buy it. You have nothing to pay. You have nothing to contribute. Your talent, your ability, your achievement in life, you could be among the rich and the famous, but that will not merit you the salvation of God. You will never know the joy of entering into heaven. It's only through the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for you. He gave his life for you. His love, his compassion, it's toward you tonight. Will you respond? He loves you very dearly. There's one more uh, verse I'd like to quote uh, to you. And here is, For this reason I say to you, her sins which are many have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Jesus speaking about a prostitute when he quoted these words. Can you imagine that? Remember the lady that they brought to her, the Lord Jesus said, we caught her in adultery. According to Moses' law, she should be stoned to death. And Jesus was not hasty in making a decision or being judgmental. He wrote something on the ground. When we get to heaven, we'll ask him what it was. And then he looked up at him and says, Then he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And you know the story well. They all sort of disappeared from the crowd one by one. Why? because they were all guilty, no doubt, of the same sin in one form or the other. Where are your accusers, ma'am? He said, I, she said, I have none. Neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. Oh, what a Savior that he died for me. From condemnation he has set me free. I trust that you'll bow the knee to him tonight. Give him your heart. Let him come into your very life. Remember, it's only a matter of a prayer way, just asking him to come into your heart, admit that you are a sinner, receive him as your Savior tonight. Our prayer is that you will do that. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the proof and the truth of your precious word, of forgiveness especially, to eradicate 
to do away with all sin as far as the east is from the west. He said, so have I removed your transgression. What a blessing. You put our sins behind your back, out of sight, never to be remembered against us anymore. How we thank you for this. Bless your word tonight. Bless the singing of the young people and the testimonies. May it really strike home to hearts. May we have the joy of hearing many who are trusting you as a result of this telecast. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.